Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you the tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today continues our series of macronutrient and nutrient breakdowns. Today we're going to be talking all about protein. Uh, protein has been very popular in the health space, um, in the longevity space. And interestingly enough, it's quite debated as to what is the optimal amount of protein and for who. And I think in this episode, we're going to lean into the concept of it depends. I think that's a good mantra to go by. Um, often when you say it depends, it's not really something that you can explain in a 60 second reel. <laughs> so that's why uh, we use the format of a long form podcast to explain the nuances. Um, although I guess we could just say it's good or it's bad and then end the podcast now. That's right. Uh, is protein good? Yes. Is protein, or I guess we could say, what is the state of protein today? Good, but not good enough. That's about right. Um, uh, before we talk about protein, do you want to tell me about your lab work this morning? You told me you had an interesting conversation at the phlebotomy center. Yeah. So as we both uh, got labs this morning, as right. anyone should, uh, preventatively, hopefully, but for whatever reason, um, I had a conversation with the phlebotomist, the previous gentleman getting labs, and myself. And he said, look at all these tubes that they're taking. They're taking four tubes of blood. And for me, there are eight tubes of blood. LabCorp always takes a lot of tubes of blood because they're kind of a third party, a middleman, if you will. But anyway, I said, uh, well, what's your record number of uh, tubes of blood? I think we both ordered a, a LabCorp panel that might have around 15 tubes of blood. Um, and then, of course, if you get uh, more and more, it's more tubes. But um, the phlebotomist said there was a patient that had 31 tubes of blood taken. So that's pretty darn near therapeutic phlebotomy. And she said it was ordered by a doctor who was one of those doctors who didn't believe in medicine, which really piqued my interest. Interesting. I wonder if they ordered every thyroid's test that starts with a T. Mm -hmm. So that's very possible. Um, the next question I asked her is, well, what type of doctor was that? So let us know in the comments down below which type of doctor you think the phlebotomist was referring to. And we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, interesting. My conversation was not quite as exciting. I was basically, hey, how's your day going? Uh, as I was fasting, I was excited to have my breakfast after I got my blood drawn. Yes. And the, the, the question of what my breakfast is arose. and. My breakfast most days is a square of dark chocolate, handful of nuts, and some hard-boiled eggs. So, of course, we talked about egg prices. Yes. But in any case, we got our blood work done. In this podcast, talking about protein, I'm interested to potentially run some DEXA scan experiments myself. Uh, I'm about due for another DEXA scan to see where my you know, bone mineral density is hopefully climbing towards mm -hmm. and my fat-free mass index and those sorts of things. And manipulating protein and seeing where that lands me on the DEXA scan would be particularly interesting. I agree. We love experimenting um, with ourselves um, within reason as it is safe, um, whether it's diet or supplement, protein quality can matter. Protein timing can matter and the amount of protein can matter. So a good rule of thumb for protein is the less quality protein sources you get in a diet, the more you can benefit from supplementing, pretty similar to fat. And I guess to break it down, we can start with the first question, you know, what is protein? Um, because, you know, protein is protein meat, is protein a plant? What is a protein and why is everyone talking about it? Talking about protein reminds me of talking about peptides because you're discussing chains of amino acids and you can break both peptides and protein. Peptide is just a short protein down into what the amino acid content is. So, for some indications, you want amino acid content to be, um, you know, per perhaps high glycine or high glutamine. And for other things, you want to avoid certain types of amino acid content. For example, methionine, which we'll get more into, of course. But that's a good way to think about protein is that it's one of the main macronutrients. That's why we're doing the series on it. Similar to fat, alcohol, ketones, which is kind of a type of alcohol and carbohydrates. Yeah, I think that's a good breakdown because when people are talking about, you know, anti-aging, the question is, oh, are you doing peptides? Mm 
And really that could be asking about drastically different substances. Oftentimes when people go on a diet, they're trying to lose weight. People go, oh, are you doing protein? Mm -hmm. um, the question is like, what does that mean? Is that you know, plant-based protein, animal-based protein, collagen protein, or the breakdown products of protein, which are just amino acids. So mm -hmm. uh, surely everyone could just take some branch chain amino acids and get a lot of leucine uh, because that's what drives protein synthesis, right? Yeah, you want a high leucine content diet for sure. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, I did hear on YouTube that you take your BCAAs before you work out and a large casein protein shake in the evening. So is it as simple as that? Sounds like it. Yeah. No, and, and this is something that I heard as well. I remember, you know, back in high school, you know, reading how to best recover from exercise, what supplements are the best. It says, well, you want to be anabolic all the time. Yes. So you want to have a supply of amino acids while you're working out, BCAAs, maybe even while you're working out and after you work out too, because mm -hmm. why not? And then you want to be anabolic overnight because you're not going to be eating while you're sleeping, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so they would say, yeah, you have a casein protein shake, you know, some milk right before you go to bed. So you're anabolic all night long. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll go through the data uh, later on in the podcast, but this doesn't seem to be uh, as simple as it seems, even though in theory, you say this to the lay person, it's like, oh yeah, you know, that makes sense. More amino acids, amino acids make up proteins, more protein mm -hmm. synthesis and anabolic overnight, make gains while you sleep. It sounds too good to be true. And it turns out it might be. It very well might be. And part of the reason for this as we'll get into is that needs to take into account the pre-existing protein intake, whether it's plants, you know, if, if there's a vegan or plant-based individual, then potentially taking in something like a casein protein, if they are even open to taking casein protein, could be more beneficial, but not even necessarily at night. So the, the anabolic and catabolic switches are not as simple as be anabolic all the time, even mTOR itself has more nuance to it, given that there's multiple pathways in mTORC1 and mTORC2. And um, even when you would think, yes, this is a good segue into BCAAs, yes, BCAAs um, certainly will help activate mTOR and be more anabolic. It doesn't look like that has panned out either. Yeah, so I guess BCAAs is a pretty good place to start. We'll start with the different building blocks of protein. Uh, BCAAs are typically very high in leucine, and there's actually not a lot of data on this despite a couple of you know, early studies that seem to promote this idea that you retain more lean body mass while you're losing fat. Um, that specific paper was actually challenged um, by a group. They wrote a letter to the editor, which I thought, you know, I, I love to see scenarios like this where people are critiquing the literature. Yes. And the placebo group in that trial actually lost more weight than the um, than the BCAA group. Hmm. And as a result, they had a, a decrease in lean body mass. So it wasn't necessarily that the BCAAs were preserving any lean mass. It was the fact that these people were eating you know, essentially an isocaloric diet, hmm. lost something like half a kilogram, I believe, um, whereas the other group um, lost like 1.5 kilograms over about an eight week time period. Yeah, you gotta keep track of those darn calories. That's a, um, going to be a recurring theme among these studies on various different proteins is that um, it is a confounding variable that is often unaccounted for even in the scientific literature. Yeah, and a statement that was put out, a, a study that was put out in the International Society of Sports Nutrition or a similar group to that, um, they actually in, a, in 2017 did a literature review and they found that there were actually no studies on BCAAs that looked at oral BCAA ingestion and then subsequent measurement of muscle protein synthesis. Hmm. Now, there were some studies that used intravenous infusions of BCAAs and the subsequent muscle protein synthesis. And those actually showed a decrease in muscle protein synthesis, uh, which is really interesting because you're literally putting more amino acids in the bloodstream, but you're not getting the hypothesized or expected effect. And it seems like this was due to uh, sort of a dilution of the essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. So you have more of the non-essential amino acids proportionally, and then your rate limiting step is going to be the essential amino acids. Yep. This was a very surprising result and props to the um, authors of this article for publishing it. Um, maybe one analogy we could put for this is it's like dysbiosis of the gut, but for protein. So the BCAAs were overcrowding the beneficial 
other EAAs. BCAAs are, of course, kind of part of EAAs. All right, so BCAAs really haven't panned out as well as you know, people have thought. And I think that the nutrition and you know sports performance community has sort of came around to this. I think there are some studies showing that maybe there's a decrease in uh, muscular fatigue or muscle pain, uh, but that's not necessarily translating into you know, performance improvements. Uh, and I think that may be confounded or misinterpreted because essential amino acids have been shown to have this effect where you have less muscular uh, fatigue and the essential amino acids are a little bit different. I still don't think that there's a ton of upside for the probably the population that's using them the most, mm -hmm. um, you know, young, healthy individuals trying to put on lean mass, which yep. I think is their probably their biggest demographic if you look to the sales. Yeah, maybe a rule of thumb is if you're already consuming one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, EAAs probably are not going to help as much. But if you were in the 80 to 90% of the population that is not doing that, perhaps they would benefit you. Yeah, and we can talk about the, the RDA for protein. I think a number of individuals have already you know, discussed this. Um, it's typically about 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram. So you have a you know 80 kilogram person that's eating 60-ish you know, grams of protein. Mm -hmm. And then people have proposed doubling that. Um, and there is some data to maybe support this if you look at yeah. things like bone density and sarcopenia. Um, but for people to get there, I feel like you know, the average person right now is actually exceeding the RDA for protein. Mm -hmm. The problem is they're also exceeding the RDA for carbohydrates, dietary fats, and primarily doing that through processed foods. So yep. basically you would have to take those calories from somewhere and then divert them towards more protein. I, I don't know if changing the RDA would have an effect because I don't think that most people are following like my plate recommendations yep. either, which are quite sensible at this point. That's a good summary. Just like fats, we discussed how um, not everybody shouldn't consume the same amount of EPA because there has kind of rightfully been a push for more EPA, more omega-3s, more protein recently because the average individual could benefit from that. But some people would certainly uh, potentially be harmed by increasing the EPA to a very high level for things, for example, AFib. And the same thing is true of protein. Yeah, it, it really does come down to being individualized. And if we're looking at the say general healthy population, and there's always this question about how much protein can you absorb? And I don't necessarily know if that's the question that people you know want to know the answer to, because I don't know that there is a ceiling on that that's been clearly defined. But the question is yep. like, how much protein is going to stimulate that adequate response and protein synthesis and lead to what for most people is a goal of improving mm -hmm. recovery or muscle protein synthesis, muscle hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of these recent meta analysis have came up with a, the value was 0 0.38 grams per kilogram. Uh, and this isn't a single meal, not throughout a day. So yeah. again, for an 80 kilogram person, this puts you at about, you know, let's see, I think that's about 30 grams per meal. So if you're trying to add, stimulate an adequate response, um, and I've heard people talk about this, yeah, make sure you're getting 30 grams at each meal so you get yep. an adequate response. Maybe you could get away with 20 in a younger population, might have to push closer to 40 grams for an older population, because um, there's this sort of concept of anabolic resistance yep. that gets discussed whenever people are advancing in age and not necessarily getting the same, having the same results they used to mm -hmm. in the gym. We hear this kind of thing all the time. An actionable takeaway is um, that could be your baseline. So that's your bottom line, 30 grams per meal. All right. And then essential amino acids, I suppose we can go ahead and pull up this study looking at uh, how essential amino acids affect potentially recovery from exercise. So this study looked at essential amino acid supplementation and was looking at the maximal voluntary contraction that could be achieved after performing some exercise. And here you see this gentleman in the... Uh, this sort of apparatus to test how strongly he's able to contract the muscles. And if we scroll down to the results of the page, we see that essentially the take home is that this essential amino acid mixture increased the amount of contraction someone is able to apply even when they are fatigued. So someone might be able to perform more exercise volume or go back and train again sooner, which you know, listening to some of uh, Andy Galpin's work that has really come out of the mainstream recently, 
it seems like the more frequently you're able to train and then subsequently re recover from that, mm. then the greater potential for you know, adaptations and muscular hypertrophy and you know, sports performance, whatever your goal is, is going to come more quickly the more frequently you can train and recover. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a very reasonable addition. But in terms of stimulating protein synthesis, this isn't something that has been particularly well studied with the essential amino acids. Um, there was a study that claimed that the consumption of essential amino acids is you know, well established. It's been well validated that this is going to increase muscle protein <laughs> synthesis kind of as a, a blanket statement. Yep. But when you go into these papers, and I, I think this was a systematic review, and you actually look at the citations, in this case, both of those citations were done in geriatric populations. Uh, one of which consisted only of heart failure patients. So you can't necessarily generalize that to what may happen in a you know, healthy individual. Mm -hmm. But to me, this kind of signals that you know maybe the elderly population would get a beneficial effect from some essential amino acids. You know, typically, they do have lower protein intake at baseline. Yep. So the, the question is kind of, do the EAAs themselves have a, an anabolic effect? If protein intake is where it, it you know, should be for optimal recovery and protein synthesis, mm -hmm. um, is it something unique that it does in the older population? And you know, certainly I've heard people um, anecdotally talk about how they feel like they are recovering better when they're using essential amino acids, you know, generally elderly patients. So I think there may be something to that. Um, what are your thoughts? I do think there's a lot of merit to the um, practice of utilizing EAAs this in general is a good example of selection bias and how it can be a positive or a negative thing. So there's a reason why they selected that group of individuals is they hypothesized and we hypothesize that an older age group will derive more benefit from something like EAA. So looking at them and then being able to apply that to your own protocol, whether you would fall into that group or not, um, can help you say, yes, this is worth it to add in or this is not worth it to add in otherwise you can kind of get on this um, domino effect of wanting to incorporate every supplement and medication that is considered beneficial and before long you're taking two or three dozen different pills every day yeah and there's a lot of you know i guess resources or financial resources that are devoted to that so if someone is using these EAAs, but they're, you know, they could simply add 50 grams of high quality protein to their diet, then it, that's going to blow the essential amino acids out of the water in terms of the health effects of that. In terms of the bang for their buck, it's going to be you know, much more cost effective to add you know, mm -hmm. the protein in versus the essential amino acids for the output that you're going to get from that. Another good example of food is medicine. Um, again, let us know in the comments. Um, we'd like it, when people debate whether or not food is medicine, we believe that it is. Yeah, love food is medicine, exercise is medicine. Um, and talking about exercise, um, collagen protein has been very popular. I know mm -hmm. you discussed this with our colleague, you know, Alec McCarthy, and yes. kind of in, in the dermatology world, there's been a couple studies here and there where it looks like skin quality is improving and the people are taking it because there's not a lot of downside. Of course, you know, it's when it falls into the category of there's benefits there, but there's also a, a financial cost and sort of a medication or supplement burden. Um, but I remember when one of these studies came out looking at the you know, Achilles tendon, because yeah, Achilles tendinopathy is a very, very bothersome condition for people. Um, it tends to be longstanding, you know, like six months, people really aren't seeing any changes. Um, this study looked at how does collagen protein um, affect the characteristics of the Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was also paired with resistance training. So they saw that the cross-sectional area of the tendon increased significantly compared to placebo. You still saw some improvement in the placebo group that was doing this you know, resistance yes. training. Um, usually these are like standing calf raises mm -hmm. where you're really loading the Achilles in an eccentric movement. That's a good study, but is it repeatable? And that was my question. So in this one, we had 11% uh, increase in the cross-sectional area of the Achilles 4.7% in the placebo group. Mm -hmm. So it's a small but significant change. And if you're trying to rehab a tendon injury, then you know why would you not want to have more tendon volume there? Because mm -hmm. I think it's something like 60% you know, plus of the weight of tendons is actually collagen. Yes. So looking at another study that came out here recently, this one may have actually been this month or last month, 
Um, but in any case, this was collagen supplementation in female soccer players. And in these athletes, they saw that the patellar tendon uh, became stiffer. And the tendons are sort of like springs. And you and I had an interesting discussion before this talking about, you know, does this translate to more power output? And the answer is probably. Probably but so. But then is that protective of injury just because someone's able to have a stiffer tendon and put out more power? Because I think women are more prone to ACL injuries from what I recall. Certainly so. Um, and a lot of that is just the body dimensions and bone dimensions as well. But I think the jury's not out on that question. Um, it's also kind of a question of um, if more muscle mass and more strength leads to more tendon injuries, if more exercise leads to more, or sorry, ligament tears, do you stop doing that because of that potential risk? And the answer to that question, both for tendons and for muscle is the same, do it, but just be more cognizant of a slightly increased risk and do so safely. Yeah. And I think if the, the question is for an athlete, do they want to have springier tendons Yes. Um, overwhelmingly, that answer is going to be yes. So collagen protein mm -hmm. may land on the WADA watched substances list. They may be taking a look at this. Yeah, it might be on WADA and USADA. We never know. Our friend Derek did just launch a type 1, type 2, type 3 collagen pro uh, product. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of people are taking this. Another interesting study that I've looked at at some point, uh, not for quite some time, is regarding the consumption of meat and uh, basically collagen directly on the bone. So eating meat off the bone, whether it's uh, chicken bone or beef bone, um, and basically eating every little bit off of it. When, when I went to Nepal for part of a summer or most of a summer to do trekking and um, my roommates were from Nepal as well, um, I noticed that when they ate it, something, whether it's a water buffalo or a yak or a chicken or whatnot, they eat every tiny little bit of cartilage, tendon, ligament, and then they, it's just normal. And even the bones, you gnaw a little bit into the bone as well. And there is evidence that if you do that, then you don't need as much collagen protein. So think of this as like, um, you know, your, your organ meat is your multivitamin. And then if you eat meat off the bone, like myself and my boys do, then you probably just don't need collagen protein as much. It's interesting. So over there, they're not afraid of a little bit of gristle, but I know that there are children here in the United States who, if they're biting into it, chicken nugget, mm -hmm. great source of protein, <laughs> then yeah. there's some gristle in there. They're not going to eat it. Yeah. Um, a little gristle shouldn't scare anyone. Of course, if um, you're talking about a child, like my three-year-old, then you want to make sure that it's cut up enough to where they don't choke on it. So I think pro, that was a pro parenting tip there. Yeah. Nice little rabbit trail. Uh, and I just thought this was interesting in the first study I referenced looking at the you know, Achilles tendon there was a, it was referred to as a specific collagen peptides. And we had to get the full uh, version of the paper in order to get the secret recipe. So that's here on the screen for you all. Mm -hmm. And it consists of high amounts of hydroxyproline, high amounts of glycine, high amounts of proline. That's sort of the theme when you look at the collagen protein. So mm -hmm. um, the secret recipe isn't really a secret and thought we'd track that down for you all. Yep. So enjoy the secret recipe. One other aside to collagen protein, uh, obviously there's high amounts of things like proline and glycine. Depending on your genetics, you might need more or less. For example, I have three of four SNPs that uh, lead to uh, just more likelihood of peeing out glycine and proline. So over a, a long period of time, it makes sense to replace those so that there is enough. It, it can actually lead to things like osteoporosis and kidney stones. So depending on your genetics, you might have different needs. For example, someone with similar genetics to that might want to consume more protein throughout the day and uh, not go OMAD, which is one meal a day. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And as the genetic understanding of these different SNPs gets better and better, I think we will move closer towards a precision medicine and we'll say, okay, like this person has these SNPs, they're not at risk of anything, you know, maybe to age 50, but then it's like, well, if you start adding in more glycine, for example, at a young age, then you're much less likely to have osteoporosis because you know, glycine is heavily involved in yep. bone mineralization. So now let's talk about protein in general. So I know there was an interesting study we actually recorded a podcast on, but didn't end up putting it out as we you know, got into the data and kind of picked this study apart. Uh, down in Brazil, they did a protein restriction study, 
And you know, basically the headline was, you know, these people were eating more calories, um, but they restricted protein and they got the same health benefits of uh, those on a caloric restriction type diet. These are people that were you know, with metabolic syndrome, overweight or obese. Um, but I think the takeaway point there was that this study wasn't necessarily well conducted because the group in the protein restriction still lost weight. Yeah. And the author's conclusion was, um, you know, that we don't know um, why these people lost weight, but they did. Um, and as far as I know, unless there are fluid volume shifts, people lose weight. And this was over about four weeks yep. um, by consuming less calories than they're burning. So the sort of equivalency there would, would seem to lead that both groups were actually, in fact, caloric restricting. Um, and one group was just restricting protein in addition. Um, and that still led to the same sort of metabolic changes, mm -hmm. blood pressure, blood glucose, and so forth. Yeah, um, it, that would be a confounding variable that is necessary to report is if someone is in true caloric restriction or not. It can be very difficult to measure this. I also believe in this particular study, part of it was inpatient and part of it was outpatient. Our friend, uh, Dr. Lyon, has also done a review or podcast on this study, I believe. Yeah, and the one sort of, I guess, hypothesis generating point from this was that the persistent effect of these health improvements was more durable in the protein restriction group. So they were sort of released back into the wild after these 27 or 28 days. And then when they had them come back in for follow-up, then they had still maintained a lot of the health benefits, whereas the group that was not protein restricted seemed to have trended back towards their baseline from what I recall. So it'd be interesting to see some more uh, conclusive research done. I think mm -hmm. it was a you know, good hypothesis just to see, you know, what happens in a short amount of time, you know, 27 days of low protein isn't going to destroy somebody's health. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that this study is like absolutely concluding that low protein is the way to go if you're trying to improve your health. Agreed. And then I guess we can talk about uh, protein and satiety. So earlier we talked about you know, people saying, oh, if you're on a diet, it was like, why well, are you doing you know, protein? Because it's the new thing. If you're you know, on a diet, then you should be you know, eating lots of protein because protein always increases satiety, right? Yeah, so uh, macronutrient breakdown is just one of our seven plus uh, interventions, like um, lifestyle interventions for tracking how a diet is and how well you would adhere to that diet. When you're tracking protein, um, the timing of that protein does matter. Yes, the endogenous GLP-1 release from fat, protein, and carbohydrates does differ, but it looks like it's mostly the foods that contain protein and not the protein itself that drives satiety, which somewhat makes sense because often uh, ultra palatable, ultra processed foods have the least satiety and then whole foods have the most regardless of macronutrient content. Yeah, so it sounds like protein is just a sort of correlation with like if you're having a diet that has more whole foods, mm -hmm. higher quality foods, you're going to be eating more protein. So I guess think of things like uh, beans and lean meats in place of Pop-Tarts. Obviously, you can eat a lot more calories from Pop-Tarts than you can from beans, mm -hmm. lean meats, you know, high protein sources. And they've actually recreated this sort of satiety scenario where they made a, a casserole, a delicious shrimp casserole yes. of sorts. <laughs> And they put 10% protein um, and then different intervals all the way up to 30% protein in the dish. Mm -hmm. And some people will say, well, that's still too low. It should be 100% like protein. Hmm. Uh, but in any case, there was no difference in satiety between the groups because they didn't know exactly how much protein they were getting. They just ate this casserole and it's like, well, how full do you feel? Mm -hmm. Are you having cravings, et cetera? And there really wasn't a difference regardless of the amount of protein someone was taking there. So I, I think it really does come down to the diet quality like you're talking about and the foods people are choosing to eat. Here's my uh, proposed study design. You have boiled red potatoes and chicken chips. I forget what they call them, but it's the chip that's made of basically pure chicken. And then you compare those and then you have chicken breast and potato chips. And you look at satiety of both of those groups, of all four of those groups. Interesting. You could you could do a swap there. You could have boiled potatoes and boiled chicken breast. Yes. You could have and you have chicken chips and potato chips. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a wonderful design. Maybe that'll get funded at some point. Yes. Let us know if you could help us fund. Uh, we would love to do this study.
Interesting. So talking about, uh, there's kind of this, I guess, controversy between plant protein and animal protein. And um, I don't know if people in these two groups really hate each other or if it's just sort of amplified by what I see on social media. But in any case, there's this debate about which protein is better and also the question of does it really matter that much? Mm -hmm. So when you look at plant protein, um, there are some advantages there. Um, and you and I have talked about methionine restriction. Um, there's not a ton of human data there, but the preclinical data seems pretty compelling for lifespan extension yep. in rodent models. And, <clears throat> and there are some clinical trials now um, in cancer patients restricting methionine, and they seem to have generally positive results. Um, but why would this be important? I know you and I talked through the you know, pathway of you know, homocysteine converting to methionine and, and how that is synthesized, how it helps cancer cells. So why would restricting methionine, which is an amino acid that makes a mm -hmm. protein, be beneficial in any way? Yeah, so this is a complicated mechanism, but um, high homocysteine can be associated with many things. One of them could be trouble with donating methyl groups. Another thing could be inflammatory status. If homocysteine is over a certain threshold, which is probably around 16, it's even associated with blood clots independent of having cancer. So um, methionine is kind of a, a double-edged sword, both for good and for evil, depending on many things, but a lot of it is just genetic and also uh, what other aspects or what other things do you have in your diet? For example, creatine or betaine containing foods or supplements can help control with can help control homo, um, methionine and downstream to that homocysteine. Um, but there is a, uh, I guess this is another good example of an individualized approach. If you have foods with higher methionine or if you have foods that are more animal-based, then you're more likely to have peripheral circulating amino acids, which are uh, basically ready to be used as building blocks for cells that are quickly growing. Yeah, and I think this really would come down to specific types of cancer because there's cancers that really thrive on glucose. Yep. Um, the more insulin, the more glucose they can shuttle in, the more they're going to grow. There's uh, cancer cells that really thrive on fatty acid metabolism. And it, it's not necessarily surprising to see that there's also cancer cells that have found a way to you know, convert specific amino acids into an energy source and, and to grow themselves. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the this sort of association you sometimes see where there's an unexplained elevated level of B12. Yep. Um, and usually it's because people are taking B12 energy drinks, even, yep. even if they're not aware of it. But there is an association. Sometimes you have these elevated levels of B12 in cancer. And it's interesting when you look at the way that that breaks down and the, the biochemistry, the B12 is a cofactor for conversion of homocysteine to methionine. Mm -hmm. So the question of, okay, you know, is, is this cancer somehow driving the machinery of the body to you know, have more free B12 so that it can convert more homocysteine to the methionine? Or is that even relevant in the, the serum um, because these things are happening at the tissue level? I think there's a question mark there, but it's certainly intriguing. Yeah, definitely a question mark. Um, one other point that we briefly discussed earlier is mTOR signaling. So and uh, mTOR is technically an oncogene mammalian target of rapamycin. And of course you have input from um, different areas of the cell, mTOR1, mTOR2, but from a thousand foot view, higher levels of circulating amino acids lead to more mTOR signaling, kind of the opposite of taking rapamycin, which can be an adjunct uh, chemotherapy drug. So that's kind of a, another growth pathway that can be of concern with very high levels of circulating amino acids. Yeah, so animal proteins, since they lead to, or at least in this example, um, you know, whey protein, leads to more circulating peripheral amino acids than a plant protein equivalent. Um, you may have a higher ceiling there for muscle protein synthesis, but you also have a higher potential for cells. You don't necessarily want getting those amino acids also picking them up. Mm -hmm. So I think the question here is not really, you know, what is the superior protein, but what does this lead to in terms of, you know, an outcome of sorts? Mm -hmm. So there's this interesting uh, data here where it actually goes through a lot of these different outcomes that people are interested in. And, and basically the two that we'll look at are lean body mass, and then also we'll look at um, grip strength, which was kind of surprising. So if we go down and we look at these um, absolute percent changes here, uh, and this one is looking at 
uh, animal protein compared to plant protein on absolute lean mass you know, in kilograms. And the changes are very small. Um, and I don't think that these studies were you know, controlling for protein quality, like some mm -hmm. of the critics will point out. Uh, but basically, you're looking at a plus or minus 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 kilograms. So like, less than a pound of absolute lean mass change. And then when you go down to the next chart here, you see you know, that there is basically a five-ish percent difference yep. in absolute lean mass. So a little bit of an advantage to the animal protein side. But the question is, does that 5% over these studies, which are eight weeks or 16 weeks long, like, does that really matter if you're looking at building your way to having the optimal amount of lean body mass over 20 or 30 years? Yeah. And you know, the answer is probably not. One result that kind of surprised me was looking at uh, grip strength here. So consuming animal protein compared to plant protein, um, actually plant protein was favored in this case. And there is a smaller number of trials, but mm -hmm. it is interesting. I don't really have an explanation for that. Yeah. Any thoughts on your end? More gardening or mother or other activities that lead to more usage of grip. Ah, a plant eating bias. Yes. Interesting. But anyway, we thought that was interesting. The differences aren't huge there. And I think people will kind of get into these debates that don't really matter a lot in the in terms of like your absolute goal over a 10 year period, over a 10 week period, if you're trying to maximize the amount of lean body mass and you want every extra 1% Olympic athlete or something like that, probably animal protein is going to be slightly better. Mm -hmm. But if you are just um, wanting to map your way to you know, longevity um, and you can do so and have the you know, freedom and flexibility to build out your diet, very carefully, mm -hmm. then it probably doesn't make a huge difference in terms of absolute lean body mass that you'll accrue over time. The other question that I ask each individual is, why not both? And is there other reasons, whether they're ethical or just whether they're uh, what you like to eat, which we'll get into shortly, where you would want to consume less animal-based protein or plant-based protein? Um, for me personally, I like consuming more animal-based protein in the morning, more plant-based protein in the afternoon and evening um, for a number of reasons, but um, less leucine, uh, less circulating amino acids in the evening, kind of like a, some of the same benefits theoretically as taking a micro dose of rapamycin each evening before bed. And then also uh, it, it's going to, uh, at least in my case, it's going to be easier for me to take my whey and casein protein shake in the morning, which I like to do. Interesting. And does this relate at all to sort of the um, circadian clock that people have where nutrient sensing pathways, like, you know, people that have used CGMs to develop their intuitive eating, mm -hmm. um, they'll see that in the morning they seem to be able to tolerate more carbohydrates, yep. whereas if they're having a snack before bed, even if it's like some berries, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll see their glucose spiking. It's like, why is that doing that later in the day? Um, are you thinking along the same lines of like amino acid utilization and, and more mTOR driving those into the cells. And then later in the day, having perhaps less peripheral amino acid is um, the same way you don't want to spike your you know, blood glucose before you go to bed. You don't want to spike your uh, circulating amino acids before you go to bed. Yeah, it's kind of my own version of uh, time-restricted feeding light. So instead of actually restricting the feeding, you restrict um, like various macronutrients or protein sources to some degree. Um, and you can obviously be flexible with that if you have a social event or whatnot. But I'm um, getting into a habit like that where you know that your CGM data is relatively nice and smooth, not that it has to be perfect, and not that you would even want to follow that too often. But it's one of the tools that can help develop a diet to which you can adhere to that is maximally healthy for you at the same time. Yeah, I think it's a great concept. and uh, It makes sense fundamentally. I don't know if you would see differences if you did like metabolic ward and measured all these things for like six weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you are having less net mTOR activation over a lifetime, but you're still doing the exercise and having progressive overload, yep. I think you would still reach your goals. I don't think there would be much of a difference there, yep. uh, but potentially shifting things away from pro-cancer pathways. Mm -hmm. Hopefully so. All right, and then food enjoyment. So this is something we just touched on. Uh, basically, People are you know, ethical 
Uh, sometimes there's a reason for going on a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Um, you know, they don't want animals to suffer. You know, I certainly don't want animals to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a bit of, you know, people will avoid thinking about things that are disturbing. So mm -hmm. um, like myself, you know, I don't intentionally restrict uh, animal products. Um, but I also don't intentionally think about the factory farming and these animals that are probably unhappy. Just like people who are, are vegan but still yeah. have an iPhone you know, aren't thinking about the conditions under which these things are manufactured yes. and then the environmental effects. So I think if someone is doing that and that's their path and they want to try and make the world a better place, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing at all to do. Um, but you know, for myself, I eat, I joke that I eat a animal-based and a plant-based diet because I eat about a pound and a half of fruits and vegetables per day and not quite a pound of meat per day. I also have some eggs and dairy in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that I'm on you know, both sides of there. And to your point earlier, it's like, why not both? Yeah. Um, as people know, if they listened to our podcast a month or two ago, um, my wife and I recently harvested some of our young roosters to be good stewards of what God has given us. Um, we wanted hens, especially with the price of eggs. And we do eat our pasture-raised eggs. Um, we do not have any extra for those who are asking. <laughs> but um, it is a difficult process. And um, going from, you know, literally egg to dinner plate and doing 100% of that ourselves is surprisingly difficult. So sometimes it almost seems like the price of meat is still low even after the price spikes. But um, it, I think it has been good to involve my boys in that process just so they know, for example, I take my three-year-old down to the fridge and whenever he goes to the fridge, he points at some of the roosters that we harvested and he says, is this one bubbles or is that one bubbles? So um, I guess that's just a microcosm of um, my or my family's individual path of um, being at peace with how we eat and then if someone does not want to do that, I think that is also a reasonable outcome. Yeah, and I think that's where we're at on this is we think you can go down either path and you can still build out a healthy eating plan and there's no need to call someone a psychopath just because they're on the other side of the spectrum mm -hmm. that you are. You know, there's people that are carnivores, there's people that are vegans and they seem to especially not like each other and yeah. like calling each other psychopaths. But if, if someone does want a good place to get um, you know, ethically raised, pasture raised chickens. Um, they can see our podcast, my podcast with Tyler, who has a uh, kind of like a family farm in California. Um, he is not a sponsor, just throwing that out there because I think he is a good person. Absolutely. Good info for people. Uh, and then the other part of this comes down to uh, probably myself. The reason, two reasons that I am still, you know, 50 50 plant and animal based is the ease of meal preparation and planning for my micronutrients. Yeah. So right now I eat consistently the same foods, sometimes the identical foods, sometimes to the enjoyment of our coworkers. <laughs> um, but I know that every day I'm hitting about 90% of my micronutrients that way. Mm -hmm. Now, it would take me some time and some planning if I was going to replace all of those animal products and try to you know, incorporate plant-based alternatives but probably increase my you know, supplemental protein and then add in you know, some B vitamins and, and things of that nature. So there's a planning aspect of it. Uh, and then the fact that I, I just enjoy animal foods. So, you know, just like a lot of people, I enjoy you know, a nice steak or a nice burger. You know, mm -hmm. these things are enjoyable and you yep. know, being in a social environment, um, you know, I find that it adds to my quality of life. Yeah, oh, um, that's a good approach. Uh, another kind of like rule of thumb is when it comes to plant-based diets, um, again, planning for nutrient status, including micronutrients, there's things that you should certainly watch and it would be exceedingly difficult to not utilize supplementation for things like vitamin B12, potentially even vitamin D, um, possibly some B vitamins, um, other B vitamins, uh, iron would be another one. We don't have to get into the nuances of heme and non-heme iron and bioavailable iron, but it's certainly an important thing to track. Um, especially given that a lot of females that lose iron through menstruation or running also um, tend to consume um, like less bioavailable sources of iron. So um, keeping in mind all of those micronutrient statuses is important. Yeah. And on the flip side of that with the iron, if you have someone who is genetically prone to iron overload, 
then they may stand to benefit from a you know, plant-based diet where they're going to be taking in and absorbing less net iron. Um, but yeah, some of the micronutrients you mentioned there, I think, are particularly important. And just like there are reasons for associations in the literature between um, heart disease and certain cancers and people who eat more meat, there are also reasons that it shouldn't just be ignored in vegetarian and vegan populations where they have higher incidences of you know, B vitamin deficiency, iron deficiency, uh, depression, uh, lower bone mineral density. Mm -hmm. And just like there's things you can do if you still want to have and incorporate meat into your diet, you can reduce your cancer risk, you can reduce yeah. your cardiovascular disease risk. Just like if you're a vegetarian with careful planning and you know, doing things that we know are beneficial for bone density, for example, monitoring your B vitamin levels, supplementing when appropriate, um, you can definitely build out a healthy pattern on either side, but to sort of explain away all of the associations on either side, I think is just um, not being scientifically thorough and probably mm -hmm. is where people's biases are showing through. That's a good balanced approach. For those who consume a very large amount of animal protein and dairy protein and little plant-based protein or food at all, then certainly considering something like an aspirin, even if it's just for um, certain types of colon cancer risk, considering fiber heavily, and then considering something to decrease TMAO conversion or even checking to TMAO, that would be a good start. Yeah, and there's always things you can do to, to risk mitigate. So perhaps we'll build out a, a video on a you know, carnivore diet health stack and a vegan diet health stack at yeah. some point, because I think people would really enjoy that content. I like that. I guess one of the reservations I have when I'm, you know, people are asking about their diet um, and they're like, you know, it's very common that people have levels of circulating ApoB that are not necessarily optimal. And they will say, okay, well, what can I do to lower this if, if I want to get it as low as possible? Um, and the answer from a, a diet standpoint is probably, uh, you know, a, a low fat vegetarian diet. Yes. That's going to decrease ApoB, but may not be the optimal path to their other health goals, like yes. increasing lean body mass. So the question is, you know, what is this person willing to do? You know, do they want to manipulate that only through lifestyle? They're very opposed to any sort of supplementation or medications. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, you know, we can manipulate it through diet to a large degree, may or may not get into that sort of optimal zone for that person. Mm -hmm. But my reservation about telling people to just, you know, oh, we'll just cut out uh, eggs and red meat, you know, which eggs don't really have a lot of saturated fat. Mm -hmm. They do have a lot of cholesterol. So there's sort of this misconception and there are egg hyper responders out there yep. and there are people who do not hyper respond to eggs. But, but when I tell someone, you know, just cut out meat and eggs, if I were to do that, uh, basically meat and eggs are about the only food that people are eating that has some nutritional value yep. on average in the population because people are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Yep. They're eating too many refined grains, not enough whole carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates, um, too many processed sugars, um, nuts and seeds. People tend to do okay there. Um, still not eating the same degree as they do uh, with meats, but we'll put up this graphic to kind of look at the dietary patterns. And this is from mm -hmm. healthy people, 2020 to 2025 goals. And I just think it's really interesting to see what people are eating on average. And uh, if you're taking something away, the question is always going to be, well, what are they replacing it with? Yep. Ultra processed foods and processed foods. So the food pyramid does not have processed foods as the largest group. Um, so I guess that would be kind of one of its weaknesses. But if you interpret it accurately, then, uh, of course, people are not supposed to be consuming a huge amount of processed and ultra processed food. Yeah, and I just had this idea as we're looking at this chart, uh, we should create internally a food pyramid based on what people are actually eating. I think that would be quite comical yep. you know, because people like to blame food pyramid and health my plate um, for their you know weight gain. We could say this is my plate and then this is what your what plate doing. actually yep. looks your like. Your plate. We can call it your plate. I think so. That'll be fun. So we'll put that together internally and post about it at some point. All right. And, and we talked a bit about mm -hmm. iron overload earlier. And I think it's great when people are out there sort of reasonably self-experimenting or perhaps unreasonably and then putting forward uh, results of this with their health. And an example of this is, you know, Paul Saladino, who, you know, I don't agree with everything that he says, but he's a very likable guy and has recently talked about his blood work and 
how his diet has affected that. And I know he's made a lot of changes. He's been vegan, he's been carnivore. Now he's eating meat and fruit, I believe. Um, but he posted recently about his ferritin levels, which yep. have been creeping up, um, likely because he is eating about three pounds of ground beef per day. Mm -hmm. And he has actually started donating blood to offset that. So I, I think he probably does feel very good on this diet and lifestyle that he's living. I mean, if the average person just incorporated the exercise that he's doing and stopped eating processed foods, I think they would also improve the way that they feel and function. Um, but it just points to even in someone, uh, because he had his genetic testing done, he doesn't have a genetic predisposition to iron overload. Um, but even in a person without that predisposition, you can still have ferritin start creeping up on you yep. if you're eating a lot of iron rich foods. Kind of reminds me of people that have very high ApoBs and uh, LDLs without familial hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, it's interesting though, because those people tend to claim that the ApoB is completely irrelevant in the development of atherosclerosis. Whereas it looks like um, Paul is actually donating some blood, having these phlebotomies done to yep. try and you know, correct the underlying issue. So, Which is excellent. Yeah. And then what about different protein intakes for people at different stages of life. So um, do I need to, you know, if and when I have a child someday, should I be putting protein powder in their formula uh, so that they can make some gains? Or, or when should you start looking at protein? And I guess we can start in like young adults, so maybe 25 and below. Okay. So yeah, kind of starting from the start. Um, breastfeeding babies is good for them. Um, this is something that is very well characterized in the literature. And yes, human breast milk has a more optimal protein quality and protein to fat ratio. Um, that is why we do not recommend giving things like cow's milk to infants under the age of one. Um, after that, having high quality protein sources, including dairy. Um, in fact, I think there was a study out of the Netherlands um, looking into why they had the largest skeletal structures and they just eat a ton of dairy, cheese, milk, and meat. So those things can be particularly useful. Um, things like bone marrow, great sources of iron, great for very young children. And then as they grow, um, lots of good protein sources. So, you know, a balanced diet of both plant-based and animal-based proteins is great for a developing skeleton. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I, I haven't raised a child, of course, but I hear some people talk about, you know, the only thing their child will eat is like macaroni and cheese and they go through these phases. So, uh, I don't know, do you go to the uh, extreme of making burnt in mac and cheese, something that's very palatable so that they're also mm. getting some more complete proteins? I suppose you could. Um, there's a lot of different strategies. Um, the strategy that we generally use is we decide what they eat and when they eat, they decide how much they eat. So there's several variations to this, but uh, we put all their food on the plate at the same time. There's no special dessert or whatnot. And sometimes they'll eat a lot of one food and sometimes they'll eat a lot of the other food. But um, each child certainly has preferences. For example, my 18 month old really likes meat and cheese. And that is just what he likes to eat. And he is extremely lean and his gut almost looks like a little bodybuilder gut with almost no subcutaneous fat, yet it is protruding quite a bit. So it's interesting to see how their food preferences and eating habits develop along with um, just uh, you know, their stature in general. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I guess the next stage is um, someone who's a young adult. Um, so we'll call that, you know, I guess, 25 to 45. And kind of the blueprint that I think of here is, you know, these people are very early in their life. So their health status is very fluid. You're sort of building towards your peak bone density, building towards your peak aerobic capacity, your peak strength is all going to be in this sort of window. So I think emphasizing protein to reach those specific goals mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yep. So you know, young adults, I think you're at a significantly lower risk for cancers. Yep. You know, the excess methionine is perhaps not a zero concern, but of less concern. Mm -hmm. uh, the analogy that I would use for this is the fact that I worked night shift in the hospital for six years. And I was obviously a young adult when I did this. And I'd like to think that my body was more capable of repairing itself during that time period than if I was working six years of night shifts at yeah. age 65. Definitely. Um, another way to look at this is if you're a 
prepper or if you're prepping for the uh, centenarian decathlon, then you need to stockpile things that are going to prepare you to do so. So you're not, you know, when you're 45, your goal is to not be above a, uh, like a negative two for your Z-score, for your bone density. Your goal is to be far above the uh, average or the mean. So maybe, you, maybe you're two standard deviations over the mean. That way, by the time you reach age 90 or 100, then you are still not in like the pathologic area. Yeah, it, it's really banking as much um, vitality as you can. Uh, and there are different aspects of this. Um, we may, uh, as a clinic, take the Andy Galpin challenge. I, I'm just kind of terming it that, yes. seeing what areas we excel in and what areas we maybe don't excel in. Uh, like I said, mentioned at the start, I'm due for uh, another DEXA scan coming up soon. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get one of those, you know, get kind of a new baseline for this year, and then you know play around with things and then check it again, as we like to do with the data. So I, I think the problem is that in young adulthood, people are not looking at this. They're sort of doubling down on family doubling down on mm -hmm. um, acquiring financial resources, yep. pursuing their career. Um, and it doesn't take an enormous time commitment to also work on your health simultaneously. Yeah. I think more people are interested in their health now, but let's say this case study, this person you know, didn't. So now you're 50 years old and you're trying to make up for lost time. So if someone got this criteria right there, optimally healthy. They have great aerobic capacity, great bone density, great lean body mass. Middle age, it would seem it makes sense to go ahead and dial down protein a bit and just maintain your lean body mass yep. if you're able to do that with, say, the DEXA scans you're getting every year or two. It's not something you do super frequently, um, but looking at whether you can maintain that lean body mass with less protein because there is an association with more protein intake in middle age and an increased risk for all-cause mortality. Mm -hmm. And we can argue about whether this is from processed foods or processed meats or more mTOR activation, yep. but there is an association there. And the best thing you can do to reduce all-cause mortality is gonna be exercise. So there is a bit of a debate, but I think if you have, let's say you haven't achieved that, then you don't necessarily need to restrict protein in middle age if that's going to help you reach your sort of middle age um, vitality peak, we'll call it that. Mm -hmm. um, because there's still time, like you're 50 years old doesn't mean you just can give up on things. You can make a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is new to resistance training, I wouldn't be surprised to see them put on 15 pounds of lean body mass in yep. you know, three or four months. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get their, their newbie gains, and especially if they're going about this in a very targeted way, working with a personal trainer, a provider, a doctor that has their goals in mind, those people are going to be able to make a lot of progress still. Um, and then I think it still comes down to, you know, once you reach that peak, can you maintain that with, you know, let's say, plant protein or less protein or um, shifting towards more of a blue zone diet where these people are eating more you know, complex carbohydrates, not a lot of processed foods, obviously, mm -hmm. things that we know are associated with positive health outcomes. And associative studies aren't perfect, um, but I think that's the sort of framework I would look at it as. And then what happens when people get into older age? Let's just say 65 plus. Mm -hmm. So if you're in older middle age, 50 to 65, maybe you are cruising on a medium protein diet. And um, that way you're kind of preparing yourself to go on a, a full protein blast when you're 65 plus. Um, in these cases there, as we mentioned, there's kind of a bit of a, a protein resistance, if you will. And it just takes more protein to overcome the threshold needed to benefit um, lean body mass and also bone mineral density. So um, a lot of times in the 65 plus age category, before any other like niche concern for, um, you know, metabolic health or circulating amino acids or cancer risk, the health span is of more importance. So maintaining function and preventing pathologies like sarcopenia and osteopenia, um, and then just giving a good quality of life is of main focus. Yeah, and the emphasis is still going to be more on exercise than diet, although diet is very close, number two. Yep. Um, but if you are, let's say you do make it to 65 and you've never gotten in shape, 
that doesn't mean that you, you know, it's, it's all over at this point. There's still a lot of improvement that can happen regardless of where your hormone levels are at. You know, that, that can be helpful, but getting started is much more important than dialing in every variable. I think a lot of people get caught up in the details of like, okay, what supplement should I start taking mm -hmm. before I get started with my plan yes. when it should be, go ahead and get started with the plan and then, you know, fix things, make it better afterwards. Uh, kind of like our podcast, right? We didn't mm -hmm. wait until we had a, a nice studio to start recording things, but we have certainly improved over time and we've had a lot of fun doing so. Mm -hmm. And I think people, even if they're an older age, will have a lot of fun improving the status of their health and quality of life and um, having the, I guess, luxury to push protein a bit more um, in older age because they have this sort of anabolic resistance where yep. perhaps they're not quite driving mTOR as much from a given uh, gram amount of protein. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that's where you also look at things like, um, you know, rapamycin that can potentially yep. you know, slow down um, cellular turnover and then also not necessarily restrict uh, muscle function, muscle growth. Um, there's not a human study there, I know. Uh, there's a Dr. Stanfield down in New Zealand, I believe, who's trying to fund some research like yep. this. From the preclinical data, it doesn't look like that it impacts muscle growth, but we know those things don't always translate perfectly into humans or we would have uh, a lot more scientific advancements. Mm -hmm. Like anything else, the dose makes the poison and being able to get you know, 80 or 90% of the benefit with 10 or 20% of the input um, from a health standpoint and also from a function standpoint is usually the goal. Yeah. And now, as you mentioned, kind of at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about protein timing uh, and sort of the bro science that both of us heard when we were, you know, just getting into weightlifting and improving our strength. Uh, and that was, you know, take casein protein to be anabolic while you sleep. Yes. Um, and you found this sort of gem of a study where um, these individuals, men and women, um, were taking in casein protein either in the morning or in the evening. And what did they find? Yeah, they found a lot of interesting things, but of what they found, almost nothing was statistically significant. Maybe clinically significant, but not statistically significant. And part of that is because there is only around, I believe, 20 individuals in each group. So maybe if there had been a hundred in each group, then it would have been slightly better. But if you look at the uh, kilogram weights, it did change slightly. And if you look at the fat mass, um, there were some very small changes, but it actually went slightly down in the evening group. Again, not significant. That's 0 0.2 kilo, uh, yeah, 0 0.2 kilograms, I believe. And then fat-free mass was um, not statistically significantly changed, but it was 0.4 in the morning group and then um, 1.2 in the evening group. So it's hard to make a definitive conclusion just from this graph, but perhaps there is a slight skew towards um, at least acutely for lean body mass accrual, consuming casein in the evening, if you look at the weight, yes, it also changed, but uh, I like that they checked fat mass as well. Uh, by the way, I think this was via bod pod um, as the, the method, so it wasn't um, just bioimpedance or anything like that. Um, not quite enough to make a conclusion, but even with this potential difference, I would say it's probably small enough to where um, my concern of consuming casein in the evening every single day and having very high levels of circulating amino acids and more mTOR activation is probably not worth it because the group that consumed it in the morning also had quite a bit of benefit as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Both groups improved their lean body mass. And this reminds me of a paper we talked about on the podcast previously where, you know, bench press strength went up something like 40 pounds, but those individuals, um, it, it was found to be statistically insignificant. Pinch press of 40 pounds sounds pretty significant. <laughs> yeah, I would say a bench press of 40 pounds, an increase of 40 pounds is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. um, but which group actually got stronger on their bench press, uh, morning or evening casein protein? It was the morning. So uh, that's hard to say if it's because they had a nutrient partitioning effect or uh, if they had like a water retention effect during the day. But it's not exactly what you'd expect. So perhaps. Um, morning is better from a strict standpoint, evening is better from a 
a lean body mass accrual standpoint, but probably not in the long run, and perhaps not if you um, had isocaloric intake between the two groups. They actually measured calories around here as well, but given that this is a small enough study, I think that um, the big takeaway conclusion that we would make is that um, consuming in the morning is a more reasonable strategy from a health standpoint. Yeah, it, it certainly makes sense. And, you know, this sort of theory of you know, partitioning nutrients early in the morning, I think holds a lot of weight and makes a lot of sense. Uh, maybe there'll be some studies that are able to elucidate these differences. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is a lot of good information that we've covered today. So kind of a high level overview of protein and a little bit into amino acids, specific mm -hmm. types of protein. Um, and to wrap this up and to spark some discussion, some vegans and vegetarians will consume oysters uh, because these are thought of as non-sentient beings. So mm -hmm. let us know in the comments if you think that vegans and vegetarians are allowed to consume oysters on their diet. As always, thank you for listening and we appreciate your time. May God bless you with health and happiness.